Edward Murrow once said, If you want to see some sin, forget Paris and go to Kansas City. In spite of prohibition, bars were still open, alcohol was served freely, and there was no fear of the police shutting any party down. Gambling and vice industries operated without worry and flourished. Jazz music could be heard at every corner, and some say that Kansas City made some of the best jazz musicians to ever walk this earth. All in all, Kansas City was the heart of the Roaring Twenties, almost entirely because of one man by the name of Thomas Pendergast. This is the story of how he kept one of Kansas City's most powerful and influential political machines alive. At a time when Prohibition and the Great Depression had started and the Roaring Twenties had begun, Tom Pendergast showed leadership by becoming a political leader and controlling all of Kansas City and some of Jackson County without a major position in office. The immediate impact was corruption in Kansas City, and the long-term consequences or legacy included the downfall of political machines in Missouri and famous nightlife and jazz in Kansas City. While Tom Pendergast is credited with the legacy of the Pendergast machine, he was not the family member who started it. His oldest brother Jim was elected a city alderman of Kansas City's first ward in 1892, and he began the political machine that his younger brother would eventually make memorable. The brothers and their followers, called the Goats, had planned to control the Kansas City area and Jackson County, but Joe Shannon, another city alderman, and Baron Bill Nelson, publisher of the Kansas City Star, sought to oppose them with a group of followers called the Rabbits. This was the beginning of the political feud between the Goat and Rabbit factions. Though both groups were Democrats, they had very different political views. Nelson and Shannon did not agree with the Pendergast when it came to most vice industries. The Pendergast believed that gambling and saloons were good for the city and attracted crowds. At the time, Jim Pendergast owned a saloon where Tom worked. As a saloon owner and ward politician, Jim made profit off of these industries. Nelson and Shannon disapproved of things related to gambling and alcohol and didn't want a corrupted city. With the opposing viewpoints on this idea and many others, the feud between these two groups was formed and would play a big role in the Pendergast machine. By 1900, the Goat and Rabbit factions had become more tense. Jim feared that the Rabbits would take back political power, so he initiated a 50-50 compromise. This would ensure political jobs were split between both factions, keeping peace between the groups. Shortly after, Jim Pendergast began to become ill and retired from his position in office. Jim died in 1911, a year after his retirement. Tom had watched his brother's tactics and was ready to continue the political machine. Pendergast took his brother's place as a city alderman. From here, he took a more forceful approach on controlling the votes and political power in the Kansas City and Jackson County areas. Jim had never resorted to voting fraud to ensure that the Democratic Party was in control, but Tom was a much more ruthless political boss and did everything he could to make sure people were voting for what he wanted. The compromise that his older brother had made with the Rabbit Party began to fall apart and the two rivals returned to competing for power. In 1915, Pendergast resigned from his position as a city alderman so that he could focus on winning over more of the Jackson County crowd to defeat the Rabbits. By 1925, Pendergast had risen to become the most powerful political boss in the county. The Rabbit faction no longer had control over the city. Pendergast's main rise to power was because of a movement in Kansas City to replace the city council with the city manager government. A new charter was put into place and they reduced the size of the city assembly from 32 council members down to 9 council members. And it really was an anti-bossism effort. It was meant to come in and clean up politics in Kansas City. And in reality, what he did was deliver uh, Kansas City operations to Tom Pendergast. Once his GOAT politicians dominated the council, they elected Henry McElroy as the city manager. McElroy had been running the machine for Boss Tom in Jackson County with Harry Truman. This gave Pendergast complete control of the city once again. Along with Pendergast's leadership came both good and bad effects on Kansas City and its people. On one hand, Pendergast helped to supply jobs to his supporters during the Great Depression. He was able to do this mainly through his concrete company, Ready Mix Concrete Co. He also owned T.J. Pendergast's liquor distributing company and the Monroe Hotel. The New Deal program organized by Franklin Roosevelt helped to fund these companies and provide jobs for Pendergast supporters. Many local landmarks were poured with Pendergast concrete, including the Jackson County Courthouse, 
City Hall, Kansas City's Municipal Auditorium, and the Police Department. Through these actions, the people of Kansas City were able to see the positive side of Boss Tom, and also because he had earlier served as Superintendent of Streets. His older brother had gotten him the job by helping the previous mayor, James A. Reed, get elected. As Superintendent of Streets, Pendergast again provided jobs to the people of Kansas City, if they were willing to repay him with votes on Election Day. Because of all of the jobs that were provided by Pendergast, the city really didn't suffer from the Depression, and citizens were willing to turn a blind eye to the machine's negative side effects. However, Pendergast was not always such a generous leader. In fact, lots of his contributions came with corrupted price tags. McElroy made sure to hire all new police forces that proved to be very corrupt. They did not enforce prohibition and also ignored acts of gambling and prostitution. In a way, this was helpful to the city because the police could focus more on major crimes such as murder and thievery. It also helped to usher in the golden era of jazz in Kansas City. People flocked to saloons where they could gamble, drink, and listen to jazz music. Famous musicians crowded the nightlife scene because they could play at bars without worry of the police. Pendergast was also a political boss that did anything he could to ensure a solid win for his GOAT politicians. He often used very corrupt methods, such as ghost voting, in which his supporters would use the names of dead citizens and people who were never even born. The voting fraud did not end there. It was pulled along with the stuffing of ballot boxes and the intimidation of voters. Pendergast was also involved with the city's mafia and its leader, Johnny Lazia. He needed organized crime's income to help support his gambling addiction, in addition to bringing in the muscle for elections. One of the final straws for Pendergast's voting fraud was the election of March 1934. An excerpt from a paper written about the Pendergast machine at San Jose State University sums up the bloody election perfectly. In the election of 1934, the gangster element of the machine was clear. Gangsters in black limousines cruised around with no license plates, intimidating voters. Seven shots were fired into the political opposition's headquarters. One man was killed trying to stop a gang from beating an election judge. People were beaten with baseball bats. The Associated Press sent out the story. Big Tom Pendergast's Democratic machine rode to overwhelming victory today after a blood-stained election marked by four killings, scores of sluggings, and machine gun terrorism. After the outcome of this election, Pendergast decided to support Harry Truman for his campaign as senator. Truman's campaign proved to be successful. He had defeated his opponents by a long shot, all thanks to Boss Tom. Nonetheless, the city was growing weary of his rampant voting fraud, organized crime, and corrupted police forces. Pendergast had created his own ultimate city of sin. Lloyd C. Stark, a Pendergast politician, brought the eventual demise of the machine. He turned against Boss Tom by exposing him for voting fraud in an attempt to weaken Truman's campaign for senator. Pendergast was not charged, but over 200 went to jail for their roles in his voting system. Roosevelt stopped supporting Pendergast when other Democrats became angered with the machine's corrupt ways. The dying political machine took its final blow when Stark alerted federal authorities to Pendergast's insurance scams. He was sent to jail for income tax evasion for a year and three months. Boss Tom died in 1945 before seeing his GOAT politician, Harry Truman, appointed President of the United States after Roosevelt's death. Even though the end of the Pendergast machine was almost 75 years ago, Pendergast's legacy lives on. Many of the city's landmarks created with his concrete are still standing today. Without his support for Harry Truman, we might never have seen him become appointed and revered as a President of the United States. His reign in Kansas City shaped many opinions on machine politics and eventually brought their demise in Missouri. In fact, the federal investigation that was carried out in Pendergast is the reason that the U.S. has such a strong FBI today. Although Pendergast himself ended his political career with a downward spiral, he left a legacy that would hang over the city and even the nation for decades to follow in forms that were both good and bad.